Hello everyone, I'm Jacob Kaufman, I'm the Nerd on the Street, and today we're taking a few minutes to talk about why computers get slow over time. Okay everyone, so it's been quite a while since I've done a video just talking about a general computer topic. If you go back to the first couple of years of this channel, I used to do it a lot more often. But I was recording episode 77 of the Nerd on the Street podcast yesterday, and one of the people I was recording with asked this question. Why is it that like computers just get feckin' slow as hell? Is it just because the components get like start wearing down inside of them? Or do we just like conceive of it as being slow because we have faster equipment available? Now, I did attempt to answer the question in the podcast, but I wasn't entirely happy with my answer. And since I didn't have another idea for a video to make this week, I decided to go ahead and make this. I'm just going to talk about briefly some of the basic things that make computers slower over time. Now, before I start, I do want to caution everyone, be careful when you're asking questions like this and always take answers with a grain of salt, including my own answers. When you ask a vague question, you're going to get vague and usually opinionated answers. That said, the topics that I'm going to touch on are, from my personal experience, some of the reasons why computers do get slower over time. Like most things with computers, we can separate this problem into two sections, hardware and software. We'll start with software. So if you're using Windows as your operating system, which statistically you might be if you're watching this, it is very well known that your computer will get slower over time, legitimately slower. The simplest way to explain why is basically to say, over time you're installing programs, you're uninstalling programs, and you're just generally using your computer. You're installing updates, Windows updates, updates to the programs that you use. And all of those things naturally leave some stuff behind on your computer that aren't actually needed anymore, but they do impact performance. With Windows, a lot of the problem is with the registry. When you install the program, it registers itself in the Windows registry. When you install updates to the program, its registry entries might change, but it might leave some of the old unused entries sitting there. And then later, if you uninstall that program, it might or might not remove all of its registry entries. It might remove its current registry entries, but it might leave the entries from an older version of that same program. So that's extra things sitting in your Windows registry, and in addition to the registry, there's also just files on your hard drive that programs create. Over time when you're installing updates, like I said, a lot of files are going to change, and with a lot of moving parts on a system, that might mean that some programs are trying to access certain files that might have been moved or just straight up removed. And that doesn't always necessarily cause the program to crash, but it can cause errors. Those errors happen in the background and they might slow down the program. It might keep trying to access a file that's not there for let's say a second before it times out and moves on with its operation. And if that file is missing, it's been moved, it's never going to be where that program expects it to be again. That means every time you're using that program, that's one more second that you're going to wait for it to load. Like I said, I am generalizing a lot of things here, but that's just a, a high level explanation of some of the concepts at play here. Now, this is actually one of the reasons why I use Linux, because Linux sidesteps a lot of these problems that I just described. For one thing, Linux does not have a registry. Now, GNOME and Systemd are kind of trying to change that a little bit, but for the most part, everything on a Linux system is a file. That immediately means you're not going to have any registry problems because files are easier to maintain generally over time. It's easier to verify whether a file is there or not. It's easier to clean up old files. And one of the things that makes it easier to clean up old files is package management on Linux. So on Windows, you're installing programs that you download from the internet, you're downloading exe files, that you're downloading installers, and those installers are putting files all over your Windows partition. Like I said, when you uninstall that program, the uninstaller might or might not remove everything that the program installed. Most of the time it's going to leave things behind, be it in the registry or just files on your hard drive. On Linux, you're not trusting the actual program to uninstall itself because Windows has shown that doesn't work. On Linux, we have package managers, and if you're maintaining your Linux system correctly, everything that you install should be installed as a package. There are some exceptions, namely commercial proprietary programs that require you to download installers from a website and run them on your Linux system. I always hate using those. I try to avoid them. But for the most part on Linux, when you install the program, you're installing it using a package manager. If you're on Ubuntu, you're using apt. If you're on Fedora, you're using DNF. I'm on Arch Linux, so I'm using Pac-Man. 
and that package manager is actually the program that places all of the program's files onto your Linux partition. And then later, if you tell your package manager to uninstall the program, package managers are designed to remove all of the files that were installed by the program. When you update your programs, that's happening through the package manager, so it always has an up-to-date list of all the files that are on your system. And some package managers even have options to remove configuration files along with the program itself. So with a really good package manager and really good packages, theoretically, you should be able to install the program, update it over the course of several years, and then uninstall it and have just about all of the files that were related to that program removed from your hard drive. Now, in practice, it does not always work perfectly on Linux either. Personally, no matter what operating system you're using, I think you would probably benefit from a clean installation every couple of years or so. But it is very true that a lot of the software-related problems that slow down computers over time are specific to Windows. If you're wondering about Mac OS, by the way, they do things a little bit differently. With the old DMG file model, they wouldn't slow down necessarily over time because all of a program's files were contained within that DMG archive that you're just running that same archive every time you open up the program. So Macs also handle it very well and better than Windows. Now with the new Mac era of the App Store and everything that's changing a little bit, Theoretically, the App Store on Macs should do the job of a package manager on Linux, and they should remove all of the files that they're installing when you go to uninstall the program. I don't have a lot of experience with the newer Mac software, so I can't speak to how well it actually works, but that's the idea with those. So that's all of the software stuff that I was going to talk about today. I also wanted to touch on hardware. It's pretty easy to figure out that with hardware, normally when you experience your stuff slowing down over time, you're actually not experiencing your stuff slowing down. It's kind of a relativity thing. You're seeing everyone else's stuff speed up while you stay the same with your one computer that stays the same. Because a computer cannot magically get faster with the rest of the world, Intel and AMD are constantly making new processors, Nvidia and AMD are constantly making making new GPUs, and if you want to stay up to date with the latest and fastest technology, you just have to upgrade sometimes. Now part of the reason why you really notice that is because software is written for whatever the current generation of hardware is. So for instance, Blender is the program I'm using to animate Displaced Season 3. If you go back in time 10 years, animation programs back then were written for the computers that were available at that time. You could render out frames at a reasonable speed on those computers that came out in 2008. Now, 10 years later, Blender and other animation programs are being written for the current generation of technology. So although my laptop can render frames in Blender at a reasonable speed, my 2006 Mac Pro that's sitting across my room unplugged, it's unplugged for a reason. If I tried to render a displaced frame on that thing, it's going to take hours where my laptop takes 15 minutes. Some of that has to do with quality. Because we have higher powered hardware, Blender knows that they can write rendering engines that produce higher quality images and people will actually be able to use them. But another factor about software being written about hardware actually has to do with architecture. Now this is getting into some low level computer science and I actually don't have a complete understanding of this field. But programs are generally written in a high level language such as C and then they're compiled for a specific architecture. Now on Windows, you probably know about this because some programs are compiled for 32-bit and some programs are compiled for 64-bit processors. Those are two different architectures that have both been produced by Intel and AMD over the years. But really those aren't architectures. 32-bit and 64-bit x86 processors, those are classifications for architectures but the actual instructions that processors use do change over time. Intel and AMD aren't making these processors faster magically, they're writing processors that can actually accept different types of more efficient instructions. So when the programmer writing the applications that you use goes to compile their software, the compiler translates it from the high-level code into a more low-level machine code that your processor can understand. And it does that using the most efficient, low-level instructions that it can. Now you can go several directions with that. You can target a very specific architecture and say, I want to target 
eighth generation Intel CPUs and above. That means that we're going to use the more efficient languages that eighth generation Intel CPUs can speak natively, but that also means that my application is not going to be compatible with older computers. Seventh generation CPUs and below either won't be able to run at all or they'll have to run at a slower speed because they're using translated instructions and not what it was natively compiled for. On the other hand, you could say, I want anyone to be able to use my program. Target just the general Intel processor, but don't use any specific newer instructions. That has the benefit of anyone with an Intel processor being able to run your program natively, but on the other hand, newer processors won't benefit from the speed gains that the newer processors supported necessarily. This is a lot more noticeable when you're actually talking about different architectures entirely. There's x86 processors, which is what desktop computers use and laptops for the most part. There's ARM processors, which is what a lot of mobile devices use. And there's also some open power systems being developed right now, such as the Talos computers being developed by Raptor Systems. Those are designed to run Linux and they use a completely different architecture. It's not made by Intel or AMD and the intellectual property for those architectures are not owned by Intel or AMD. This is an entirely new type of processor that speaks an entirely new language. And even though you can run Linux on them, if you read reviews for the Talos computers, early owners are saying that they're noticing very slow speeds because most Linux software is written for the computers that developers have. x86, 64-bit and 32-bit processors. So even though open source programs can be compiled for these new bleeding edge open power processors, the compilers that do that compiling aren't necessarily using the most efficient language because those compilers are still being developed for these brand new processors. So this whole processor thing is turning into a little bit of a tangent, but basically, like I said, over time, software will be written for newer hardware and not your hardware. So you'll have to upgrade if you want to maintain speed in some cases. That does beg the question, what if I install Windows and I just install all my software but I turn all of the auto updaters off and I just stick with one version of everything. That is possible to do. Well, maybe not with Windows 10, it kind of forces upgrades. With Linux, that's possible to do though. You could install the distribution, install some programs and never run your package manager's update command. And theoretically, you would think your software would continue running at the same speed because it was written for the hardware that you put it on. There are a couple of more things that might still slow you down over time. One of those is hard drive fragmentation. You've probably heard of this before. Traditional hard drives are spinning disks with an arm over the disk that reads and writes as the disk is spinning around. And if you're using your computer, you're opening those programs up and you're saving files and opening files and saving new files, over time, your hard drive is gonna start running out of space and it's going to have to start splitting files up into different bits to be able to, to, be able to save it. It's going to have to split the file up into different chunks. Let's say you've got a four megabyte file, but all of the open spaces on your hard drive, it might have 10 open spaces of two megabytes. That means it's got 20 megabytes free, so you'll be able to save your four megabyte file, but it's going to be split up into smaller segments so that your hard drive can fit it into the chunks that are available. When you defragment your hard drive, it's going to try and consolidate all of the used information on your hard drive to one section and leave another physical section mostly open so that it can write and read faster. With all of that said, hard drive fragmentation is becoming not an issue anymore. That, that problem is becoming obsolete because SSDs, solid state drives that run on non-volatile flash memory, SSDs don't really have the fragmentation problem. Yes, over time they will start saving files into lots of different locations instead of just putting the entire file in one physical location, but with flash memory, there's no physical arm going around to read the files. It's just electricity traveling really fast through that SSD. So in effect, it doesn't matter if your SSD is fragmented. It might even make it faster because the electricity can travel through four different wires from four different places instead of all having to come through one wire from the same physical place. You won't have any issues with fragmentation on an SSD. That said, the very last thing I wanna leave you with is Yes, sometimes hardware degradation does just happen over time. Now this is really hard to quantify for an amateur such as myself. I don't have the tools to really show this in numbers, but sometimes hardware does just break down over time. Those electrical impulses traveling through the wires 
can travel slower if the wires start to break down. Now this is not a widespread thing. 90% of the time when your computer slows down, this is not what's going on. It's going to be that software stuff I talked about earlier, or it's just going to be your perception versus other computers, or it's going to be software getting updated. But sometimes it really does happen. A big example of this, if you want to look up an example of this, is the original 2012 Nexus 7 tablet. This was the $200 tablet that Google launched. I got that tablet. It was my, well, my first real tablet. It was a lot of people's first real tablets because it had a super low price point, $200 for a seven inch tablet. That was unheard of in 2012. How did Google and Asus pull that off? By using really cheap parts. And over the years it showed. The Nexus 7's flash memory actually did degrade over time. You could be holding the same hardware and using the exact same software, no updates applied, no missing files, no errors occurring in the background that you're not seeing that are slowing things down. Everything could be working at optimal levels. But if you're holding a tablet that is five or 10 years old, the flash memory in the Nexus 7s actually did degrade and get physically slower over time. That's getting into computer engineering, and once again, I'm not an expert in that field either. But definitely look that up if you want an example of parts actually legitimately becoming slower over time. It's extremely rare, but it has been known to happen. I think that's about all that I need to talk about in this video. Uh, like I said, most of the stuff that you notice with your computer getting slower is going to be on the software side, and aside from that, it's just the rest of the world upgrading while you're staying the same. That's the the TLDR of why computers get slower over time. But it is a complicated issue. Like I said, vague question, vague answers. If anyone watching this knows of other reasons that I may have forgotten to mention or I may not be aware of for computers getting slower, feel free to leave them down in the comments section below on this video, or even better, leave them in the forums over at nerdonthestreet.com. For now though, I hope this was interesting for some of you, and I'll be back next week hopefully with another Linux video. But for now, I'm Jacob Kaufman, I'm the Nerd on the Street, and I'll see you guys later. Bye.